in a dockyard, the size of a large airfield, an army of engineers is building a ship like no other. This is the most demanding uh, job ever. Longer than four football pitches and capable of carrying more than 18,000 containers, it's the world's biggest ocean-going cargo vessel, the Triple E. The first vessel in the series, we can definitely not afford it's being delayed. They have just 38 weeks to build and trial this monster. This is not so on. What is going on here? We also have to make sure that we're getting it right because we only have one try. If you're not improving by tomorrow, we will stop your work. This is the exclusive inside story of the men and women racing to build the world's biggest ship. Tangier, Morocco. A giant container vessel is being loaded up with 12 and a half thousand containers. Crammed with computers and chemicals, meat and machinery, the ship's cargo is worth more than $400 million. She's one of more than 600 vessels owned by Danish shipping giant Maersk Line, the largest shipping company in the world. Over the last decade, container ships like this have transformed maritime trade, slashing the cost of delivering the $4 trillion worth of goods that are shipped around the globe each year. Your shoes, your shirts, your jackets, to a lot of what you use in the everyday, your iPad, your electronics, most of it has been brought here by a container ship. One of the most important trade lanes connects Asia with Europe. It's a highly lucrative maritime superhighway, accounting for a staggering $316 billion worth of business. To maximize the revenue from this critical route, Maersk Line are about to build their biggest ship yet. The Triple E. At 400 meters long, the Triple E will be the world's biggest ship. A steel leviathan, powered by two enormous engines each capable of delivering more than 40,000 horsepower. Enough power to carry 18,000 fully laden containers at a steady 16 knots halfway around the world. The team building the record-breaking Triple E are about to move the first piece of our huge hull into dry dock number two. This is a key moment a milestone known as keel laying. The first keel, when you put that for the first new series, that's a new beginning, that's a new, now we are getting on. Now we are from block stage, now we're into dock stage, now we're assembling the vessel, we can see something happening, really happening. Now we're gonna see the vessel is getting bigger and bigger. Thank you. Thank you. It's a big day. So Peter and the rest of the team are fueling up. I think they have a big moving day today and they have took like a half an hour to get out there. These guys who are transporting the blocks, they get bored. Let's move some blocks. And then they start moving from one end to another just for fun. They've been laying here for too long, they just got a little rust along the quayside. No good. Start moving. Or maybe they just move the blocks so they make sure that the guys on the bicycle get some exercise. That could be also. The block they need to lift into place soars over 30 meters high, as tall as a 10-story apartment building. It will sit just in front of the engine room. It's enormous. Dock 2 is surrounded by water 
so it can be easily flooded to launch the ship once complete. We would uh, ballast, put ballast in the forward end of the tanks, so we have an even floating out, an even keel. The success of the semi-launch hinges on a novel invention built into the dry dock itself. Throughout the build, access in and out of dock two is controlled by a simple but clever device called a caisson gate. A floating steel box, strong enough to keep millions of cubic tons of seawater at bay. A system of ballast tanks is hidden inside the gate's steel walls. Once the dock is filled with water, workers empty the tanks in the gate, so it rises. Then, they tow the gate away. To reseal the dock, they repeat the process in reverse. As they fill the gate's tanks with water, it sinks back into position. Allowing them to pump the dock dry again. Inside the gate's control room, Peter makes his final checks. You can control the, the amount of ballast in the tanks. There's a valve in both ends of it. So you can open these and then you can fill up the dock. And they're all closed. I can see. That's good because otherwise it'll be fairly wet in the dock. Here you can see the big valves in the dock gate. They open these valves and then the dock will be sorted. Very easy, gravity. With everything ready, the crew opens the valves. Flooding dock two with 2,500 cubic meters of water per minute. The triple E floats off her supports for the very first time. The only thing stopping the half-finished hull from filling with water and sinking the ship is a thin wall of steel called a bulkhead. For Peter and the crew, it's a nerve-wracking time. Sometimes there's a mistake, there's a not closed, there's a hole. It's a, so it's a, sometimes the sink does open, but it sometimes happens like that. The team must check everything. Nothing can be left to chance. <laughs> After an anxious few minutes, the diver gives the all clear for them to open the gate. It takes two tugboats to pull out the half-finished hull. Clearing the way for the removal of the other vessels. Finally, the Triple E is towed back into her new position. Before the dock is once again sealed shut, and pumped dry.